And I came to Hawaii really through a love of, well, really a, a pure love of and the joy of discovering wine and the cultural significance of wine. My day job is actually that I run a marketing agency, and as well as the love of wine, I also love seeing wine being sold profitably. The Old Wine Conference is a non profit that I co founded in 2021, which is separate to my main business. And the founding of this non-profit was really um, motivated by my conviction that nothing happens until something is sold. And the aim of this non-profit, the Old Wine Conference, is to help to create a global value-added category for Old Vine wine, the heritage vineyards, and to help communicate and realise through the trade, a higher value and a higher price and a higher prestige for all fine wine than everything that that encompasses. <laughs> I'd just like to start by thanking the whole um, of Mia, amazing team for hosting us, and also for all the producers who've been so generous with their time and with their wines. I'm just going to kick off this session by giving you some a broader context. Um, and I wanted to explain more about the impetus behind the Old Vine Conference and all of the partners, the incredible partners and inspirational people that we work with all over the world to achieve this goal of really changing the market for Old Vine wine. So, why Old Vines? So I think there's a sort of poetic aspect to old vines and old vineyards. And one aspect of old vines which is really valuable is that they act as a, a, a muse. And we've seen this on our trip just in Umea today um, and yesterday. The old vines are really compelling and um, sort of um, absolutely inspire enormous creativity and kind of crazy dedication from many of the very best winemakers in a region. So why is this? Well, I think it's fair to say that great old vine wines, you know, the, the best old vines in the perfect spot, interpreted by contemporary vineyards today, they, they yield uniquely transcendent wines. We've all had that experience when you have a wine at the hairs go up on the back of your neck and you just know you're in something, you know, you're tasting something that has a, a transformative effect that really is still connected to the original sort of symbolic um, and um, connecting value of wine. The other thing that we have found extremely powerful about old vines is that their old vineyards are containing extremely valuable genetic information, this resource of biodiversity, and not just biodiversity, but agricultural practice diversity, is one of the most precious resources we have in wine. It's actually a precious resource, genetic diversity throughout the, the whole of agriculture, and we are at a point in agriculture, not just in wine, where there is an increasing sense of urgency that we save this genetic diversity before it's lost. And when we thought we'd solved all the problems with food production, you know, we had the Green Revolution after the World Wars, in wine, phylloxera came, that sorted, we thought we had silver bullets. And we are now realizing that, in fact, we are in danger of losing one of the most resilient and sort of re regenerative aspects of farming, which is this diversity. And we have seen all over the world that old vineyards are not just prized for what they can give of themselves, it's also for the genetic material and the um, intra-varietal diversity, as well as ancient varieties that they benefit <laughs> like marks, <laughs> like surviving marks of this genetic diversity. Just on our visit here this week, we have seen how old vines are really embedded into a community and into the affluence and the thriving 
especially of agriculture and rural communities. And this is another worldwide um, concern at the moment, is how do you maintain prosperity and allow people to live good lives when they're not in the city? So just from traveling around in your vineyards, we've seen how, how important agriculture is to this to territory and how the development of your unique varieties, your unique training systems is really embedded into the skills and the affluence and the the sort of the, the farming the, the sort of the the farming prosperity of a region. And if you lose that, then we're gonna to have to think very hard about what you replace it with. Because as we've seen, it's of enormous value, even if it's not necessarily always recognized. So the All Fine Conference, so a little bit about us. So we launched in March 2021. It was a lockdown project. We were inspired at the All Fine Conference by the actions of very visionary people who had done old vine um, awareness raising and cooperation projects in their regions. So uh, uh, organization, organizations such as the South African Old Vine Project, established by Rosa Kruger, a great viticulturalist, an incredibly inspiring figure. Uh, Janice Robinson, who had celebrated, but 20 years ago was writing about the, the precious resource of the genetic material in old vines the Barossa Old Vine Charter, Vigno in Chile. We were really inspired by our interactions with these um, bodies. And my background as a marketer and as someone who works with lots of countries all over the world, just made me think that we need to treat this like a super body, <laughs> like a, 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 almost like a super generic body, because we have to make the category as big, and as meaningful, and as compelling as possible. And we do that by having so many different threads that show in, in so many convincing ways all the different facets, which are highly localized, in which this way of looking at viticulture cracks open the farming heart, the heritage heart, and the cultural heart of everything that we love and makes wine so valuable. So we, it really took off, I have to say, and this is in great part due to my amazing colleague, Belinda Stone, who's our um, head of marketing and now a co-director of the company. So we had over 56 speakers from all disciplines, and I actually haven't realized how interesting and how compelling talking about old times would be. I mean, I thought it would be, but we've seen an enormous response. And if you'd like to view any of our previous sessions, speakers, you can do so by going to our website. Um, and we also launched these field trips, um, of which this is one. And we found the field trips to be hugely, um, hugely inspiring and actually one of the best things that we've been able to do because it's inspired so many connections and as a result of the field trips I'm already getting messages from places <laughs> in other regions for example um, who are growing um, Mouverdra as they call it in dry um, very dry regions in Australia saying what, what, what are you learning out there so you see you can create these networks of people <coughs> who care um, and who want to share and learn about um, best practices from others. We also have our regional ambassadors. These are volunteers who help us simply spread our message and tell us about great old vine practitioners in their, in their countries. So a little bit about definitions. How old is old? Well, there are some defined um, age limits set by various different organisations. The minimum, and it's the one that we adopt at the All Vine Conference, is 35 years of age. I know for, um, for a Spaniard you may think that's not that old, but there's a, there's a tactical reason that many of these organisations set the minimum age as 35 years. Um, the main one, actually, is that it's around 30, 35 years that vineyards, even healthy old vineyards, can start to become vulnerable to actually being um, uprooted. 
and the other that is in, many, in most terroirs, it's around 35 years, that you start to see the benefits of buying age um, in terms of the, the woody reserves in the trunk, you start to see the deeper um, expansion penetration and the health root network. But um, the minimum age does vary across the world. So 35 years in South Africa, 35 in Barossa, um, 30 in, in Malay, Chile, 50 in Lodi, USA, um, 70 in Priorat, and, um, and Rioja has introduced a minimum age of 35 years if you want to use the term old vine on um, that particular designation. Spain is the only country that, uh, within the EU that has adopted um, a, a legal definition within their regulations to control the use of the term um, old vines, and it's been led, as I say, by Priorat and uh, Rioja. But otherwise, the term remains legally uncontrolled, although all of these other four organisations control it by having a shared charter of, of behaviour. So they have a um, basically like a private certification. My, my feeling is that we shouldn't rush to certify. I think if you try and certify and regulate too early when you're trying to build a category, you stifle innovation and you make a burden rather than show an opportunity to help producers sell <coughs> and market and I really develop products <coughs> of their wine. But I think we will move towards certification and within the OIV, the Office International of Vine Wine, there's a working group at the moment with leading experts from all over the world who are advising the OIV on policy of codifying and, and actually defining the value of old vines within the uh, global wine sector. And OIV policy is always adopted by EU, so I think we are moving closer towards a policy of protecting old vines. And, uh, I think that will also help with some of the more the tactical implementation of policy. We were hearing today from one of the producers, we went to see how one of the consequences of EU funding for uprooting and investing in vineyards is actually being the loss of some old vineyards. So um, I think there, there, are, there are many reasons to be hopeful. Um, there is a, a groundswell of interest um, at a policy um, and institutional level, not just at a, a winemaker and regional level. We also established, with the collaboration of Janice Robinson and um, support from Jackson County Wine Estates, the first cloud database of a registry of old vineyards. Um, this is managed by a team based in the US. It's free to register in your vineyards. If there um, are any contacts here, you have old vineyards in um, of, of 35 years that you would like to simply register um, on the old vine registry. You can go to the website. It's uh, the URLs at the top there, and you can submit your vineyard. We have over 3,000 vineyards now registered. Just under 500 of those are from Spain. Come on, Spain! <laughs> We're actually about to launch a a campaign to get 10,000 vineyards registered um, within the next three years. And I think we're, are we at something like 10,000 hectares at the moment? Is that Yes. So, so we are currently, we're at 3,000, just over 3,000 entries, which represent 11,000 hectares of, of old vineyards. <coughs> we want to get to 10,000. And if it pro is that would be 30,000 hectares. And the impetus for this is that when you value something, you record it, you name it. You know, it, it you, we register our babies. You know? <laughs> it's like when you register something, you say, this is important, and we need to know what we have and what we could lose. And I'm going to talk about the, the loss, the danger of loss in just a moment. Um, so just coming to Spain, I think Spain has many reasons to be positive about your old fine resource. I, uh, I, uh, this is a purely empirical statement that I think more old, Spain has more old vines than any other country, probably. But it's, everyone I speak to in wine says, 
what's happening with Spain with the old bind, you know, surely they, they and, and, and indeed you do, and in fact, you have some of the, the largest kind of most consistent, like contiguous plots of old finds. Some of this is as a result of slightly kind of benign, not neglect exactly, but you know, um, a kind of sort of benign um, sort of little backwater and agricultural practices having not been completely, you know, <laughs> modernized. Um, and actually some of this is because of, um, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, and, and actually, um, of course, this is also a, a deeper history of the, the role of Spain in the development of the culture of the vine from the Levant and the Etruscans through into the, uh, the Spanish Peninsula, the Iberian culture, and so on. Um, you have this incredible arc of ungrafted vines. And ungrafted vines are also as an intersection, of course, with old vines. And ungrafted vines within this context of thinking of the culture of the farming of wine are becoming extremely interesting to many figures in wine. And there is an organization uh, founded by Louis Pasque of, um, of Bordeaux which is actually working to have ungrafted vines protected as an um, intangible cultural heritage, the practice of working with these vineyards. So it's, it, it's not something this is all happening in isolation. There is a movement to really um, recognize and honor these, um, the value of these, um, these vines. And you've got a lot of them. And then, and for example, and here, they, they are very happy. So you have a lot of healthy ungrafted vines. Um, the minimum vine age is becoming part of your official quality hierarchy, as I mentioned in Priora, Rioja. It's a good, a good you know, step, and, and uh, the, it may be able to inspire other denominations in Spain to do the same. And then all vines are the highest of your most famous wines, even if they don't necessarily lead with that message. Um, I mean, I'm, I mean, Amaya, I probably missed some, but I think it's fair to say some of the most famous, beautiful, iconic, visionary, sort of leading wines of Spain, they're from old vineyards, or inspired by old vineyards, or massile selections from old vines. And then, um, forgive me for calling your image workhorse, but I think it is the case that, you know, in Spain there's this rather outdated, of Spain is this outdated image, certainly from a, a UK perspective, of regions um, that um, are not necessarily, you know, Priora and Rioja and, and you know, the, the more, the regions that have had a lot of international investment. And, and I think that we see time and time again, great winemakers working with all vines in regions such as Mia um, and, um, and La Mancha, um, really get a lot of attention and they start to change the conversation. And, and then of course you have some amazing research um, resources and academics who are working with old vibes. Um, and so I think you're in a really, you're in a strong position that you shouldn't hang about in terms of moving forward. Just before talking about the company risks, I just wanted to highlight that we are at a time in the, the ideas of what matters in farming, where agriculture as part of culture is entering into the very highest levels of culturally impactful institutions and policy um, and funding organisations. This is um, the, the, uh, the latest newsletter from the UNESCO World Heritage um, Organisation. And you see at the bottom there it says agricultural landscapes. So there is a relatively new category within UNESCO World Heritage, which is for agricultural landscapes. And they, they're explicitly linking human cultural development to the development of agriculture. And of course, the, the culture, in terms of cultural exchange, cultural holidays, the, the value of culture is really what is lifting um, prosperity all around the world. But actually, culture is, it, the root of the word is in the farm, because it's when humans start to feed themselves and grow things that we develop civilizations. So um, this is a statement from UNESCO, the World Heritage. 
of human cultural development is inexorably linked to the development of agriculture because it is essentially the cultivation of nature, of the physical environment, which has historically shaped and engendered present-day landscapes and I would say also communities. Um, this is a UNESCO agricultural heritage um, site. It's a wine region. Does anyone recognize it? Yes, okay, Brad, do you recognize it? Is it Aldo No, it's, it's actually, not. <laughs> it's Alta Doro. Ah. Um, so, and, and actually, but there are a number of wine regions which have achieved um, UNESCO agricultural heritage. I've worked with a couple, and I can tell you it's been enormously impactful. It brings attention, and they're able to start this conversation about why their farming is so particular and why it deserves attention and respect and why it should be valued. But there's nothing to stop you exploring this, I would say, as a region. Um, yeah. <laughs> you can't see it. <laughs> <laughs> and then I wanted to also, so there's this broader conversation going on about agriculture as heritage and culture, which links into the old fine conversation. There's another conversation which is around a term called land race. And, and land race, what we would call, what we might call biotypes or even clones, um, but there's this. Um, it, the land race is something that's emerging as a term across food and farming, and it refers to, yes, what you would call biotypes, the um, intra-varietal diversity that is not a globally adapted cultivar, but from the wild, the wild plants comes up through land races, and land races are, in every aspect of farming, being um, considered anew as a very important part of biodiversity. So putting this into a wine context, I think we must take wine into this conversation. And certainly for a country such as Spain, where agriculture is still so important, where the food culture is so important, I think there could be great opportunities for combined messaging, where you actually really place the, your incredible biodiversity cultural practices here in that broader um, context. Um, and just <laughs> land races everywhere, even in cannabis. So <laughs> but um, you, we really need to act now. There's a window, I think, of opportunity where the value of these old vineyards, their, their genetic diversity, their cultural practices is being recognised. This is just um, a clip from um, uh, it's a, a photo from a, a conference session we held with um, Elias Lopez Montero. His point was we've lost um, an enormous number of our old vines already. Um, Pablo Rubio in uh, Ribera del Duero estimates that with two thirds of all vineyards in Ribera del Duero were lost between 1999 and 2014. Um, Rioja, Hong Kong's um, sound chair, do you know him? Great um, academic and winemaker. Um, <coughs> loss of old vineyards greater than 40 years in Rioja. I don't need to depress you, but it's just like... <laughs> I mean, you, you had a lot, but let's not lose more. Um, Again, you can see, you can um, review his presentation on, on allvines.org. So there is a sense of urgency. I don't actually have that data for Umiya, but I, uh, if it's not too controversial, it would be interesting to gather it because it just focuses the mind uh, and it gets attention on, come on, let's, let's help Umiya um, protect this. So I think that just my perspective on your your strengths. We, we heard from Sarah Jane and I yesterday on the context of Mia, so I'm not going to spend too much on this, but I would just say that we'll dry farming experts. I mean, that's an incredibly interesting skill to have. Um, and I think also your thousand hectares of ungrafted vines, that's, that's of great interest to many, um, it's not just communicators, but also researchers around the world. 
I know you say there's a, another thing um, within your sort of Spanish community, um, as well as the great growers that we've met um, on this trip doing amazing things with our vines, like Elena um, Ferron, Juan Gil, um, there are other, you have like minds in, in Spain who are doing great work. And I would really encourage you to come together in a kind of initial conversation and network because this makes you so powerful. So today is Amarin, um, uh, Fernando Mora in the Sierra de Algerian. I apologize for my pronunciation. Um, Toro, um, and we will be working with Wines from Umia in our online program um, through the year. This program is available on our website to view, but essentially, it, don't underestimate how interesting and how powerful this story is, um, and how I think that oral vines could really help you forge the future, especially when you're talking about the, the your most critical lives and the highest aspiration of what you want to be. And I think that really they could be used as the future of your organization, um, as of your denomination especially when it comes to the genetic material. Um, and um, a little bit about the online conference, I won't spend too much more time on that, except to say we would love to answer any questions that you have, and um, you can find more info about us on our website. Um, a quote from someone you may know, Alvaro Palacio, <laughs> wine from an old mine in the wrong place offers no better quality than a young mine in a fantastic location. However, if everything can be inside, old mines will give us the very best, something fascinating due to the mystery that they carry, something um, that they carry inside, what I would call wisdom of old mines. And I think that's a great summary of why we do this. Thank you. from the Instituto Mestiano de Investigación y Desarrollo Agrario y Alimentario, also known as UNIDA. And I was researching some of uh, Rothfield's uh, papers online, and she is one of the, the foremost um, ethnological researchers into really fine detail and quality of, of wine and the interaction with viticulture. So we're really fortunate to have her speaking to us today. Hey, just I just wanted to, as a explanation, how we, how why why we buy this Rocío Anidas in an old wine conference. Uh, today is because uh, we we are very aware that we need to protect our old vines. Uh, this is why uh, Via Wines are now a member of the Old Vine Conference and why we're here, why we invited you. But at the same time, uh, we know for sure uh, we are in the midst of the climate change uh, in a region uh, already. Um, Arid already, as you know, with many many uh, issues that we need to face uh, for the future. Uh, so we look at the past and we want to conserve and preserve, sorry, the heritage. But we also uh, <laughs> sector, the wine sector, not the council, wants to look at innovation, and we are very aware of uh, Inida's research on new varieties uh, crossings. With, uh, from Monastrel, from our very Monastrel, and the result, the amazing results after 20 or so years of research. So that's why we invited uh, Emida, and we invited Rocio as the head of this research to uh, tell you about a future of uh, a possible future in viticulture in Cunilla, uh, because as I say, we want to preserve. Uh, heritage, but we want to innovate at the same time, and that's it. That's the, the link uh, with the new varieties and all parts. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Carolina, for the introduction. 
Um, my presentation is a kind of new adaptation, new adaptation a strategy of monastery to climate change. Um, as we know, uh, Monastrel is the main majority in the Mediterranean area, specifically in the region of Murcia. Um, this variety re represents its position in cultivation varieties in Spain. In the third position, if only take a, a take into account red varieties. Um, this variety is characterized by having cluster of many signs. Intense from black color, thick skin, principal, and native flavor. And um, in addition, it's very well adapted to our climate, very robust, and laid by And um, as said, Carolina, the climate chain, the consequences of climate chain, are, uh, are having effect in, uh, in all crops around the world, especially in, in vineyards. And you will do the high temperatures, uh, low precipitation. Um, it's the effect can be positive in cold areas, and in hot and dry areas like the region of Murcia are negative, both for quality in grape and wines and for production. Um, in recent time, we are observing in our area a decoupling between technological and phenolic maturity a faster sugar accumulation and accelerated loss of sinking berries, an inhibition of synthesis of phenolic and aromatic compounds. These compounds are the main compounds for the organoleptic quality of wines, and changes in disease and disbalances. So to fight to these consequences, we can use different strategies. From the viticulture point of view, we can use different culture measures to delay the maturation of the palm, like branding, thinning, or managed methods, or to use uh, stock management, or the development of October, or irrigation treatment, like after the irrigation, for example. And from the analogy uh, point of view, <coughs> we apply alternative technique to use the sulfur, for example, to use tannins, methathions, lysotimans, hitosans, or to apply techniques to correct acidic problems, for example, to use calcium exchange resins, or finally, to use technique to reduce the alcohol levels, for example, to use alcohol distillation, not any color, or to, apply, or to use no saccharomyces systems. I said Carolina, or Sara, I don't remember. <laughs> I belong to IMIDA. IMIDA is the Murcia Institute of Agriculture and Environment Resulta and Development Institute. Uh, it's a public research center. Uh, our main building is located in near or close to the capital of Murcia, but we have another facilities. We have many, a lot of experimental fields. Or oh, here in Comilla is the wine, experimental winery. Um, the objective of the institute is the support and implement the research and the technological development providing solutions to the different agricultural sector of the region of Murcia. So, our approach to try to solve the consequences of the climate change is to obtain new realities by using breeding programs. Uh, to follow this, or to obtain these new realities, we have to follow different steps. The first step is the selection of parents to carry out trade crosses. For this uh, step, we, uh, we use as mother, plant, monastery, as father, varieties like Cabernet Sauvignon, Syrah, Tempranillo, or the Fejo. The second step is the selection of new varieties by great quality. The third step is the selection of new varieties as wine quality. And finally, we do the registration of new varieties. All the entire process has lasted 26 years. It's a very long process. And currently, we are working in different research lines. We are obtaining new varieties starting from one as well. We have phenol content and adapted to our climate. We have phenol content and let's show our population to our right range with alcohol, we love alcohol content. And new varieties, we obtain new varieties resistant to powdery medium and medium. 
to pay a very important in vineyards. And finally, we are adopting new varieties tolerant to drought and high temperatures. Uh, our breeding program is carried out in our experimental field. This is located here in Buyas, in the western part of the region of Murcia. Uh, on the slide, we can see the field, the vineyards. Uh, in this part of the region, the, cl the climate is semi arid, uh, continental is very similar to Milla, and the soil is climate south. Uh, now I'm going to try to explain in more detail how we get these new varieties. The first stage is dividation. Dividation consists in the emasculation of the bunch and fertilization. We have to wait for the monastery is growing. When, the, when we get the flowers, we emasculate the bunch. Emasculate means uh, to remove the stamens. Here in this video, like, um, we can see how to, how to do it. It's a very tedious process. And very, uh, you have to do it in a very careful way. Uh, you have to have a very good uh, eyesight. Yeah. And on the other hand, we obtain the pollen from the other plants. So finally, we pollinate the masculated plants with the pollen from the fire plant. Then we add the, the masculate, the masculate plants, because we want to avoid <coughs> unwanted fertilization. And then inside the bud, the breaking is happening. Then we have to wait for the, the, the plants growing. When we get the fruit, we obtain the seed. Each seed can be a potential new variety. So then we need to, to put into seed beds and uh, to, to get the germination of the seed. And then when the plant is growing approximately five centimeters, we go to, to the plant, to the, to the picture. And then we plant them. At the beginning, we plant the seed, and now we are doing a rapid process. So now, when the vineyard is growing, we can start with the selection process. We get 1,591 plants, new plants, new varieties. Um, at the beginning, our selection criterion was the following. We want to, to get a rate with the BH lead 3.8, uh, weight very less 1.8, uh, a very high phenolic composition, um, higher 2,000 mg per kilo of anthocyanin, or higher 2,700 mg per kilo of total penetration. Um, because we have uh, we also obtain white varieties, we added a new uh, criterion. This white variety had to have a malic acid content very high, higher than 2 mg per liter. So in the first phase selection by gray quality, we selected 44 red crosses and 12 white crosses. Then we plant 29 of each selected crosses in order to get enough break to, to make one and then to go through to the second phase, the second phase selection by good quality. And in the second phase, we selected 10 red crosses and three white crosses. Right now, we have six new variety registered recently for Monastery. Four of them are characterized by having a high phenol content and active to work line. These are Mirtia, Carmeide, Hevas, and Kimbal. We want another one we characterize by having a low sewer content, Carmoli. And the last one is a white variety uh, characterized by, by being adapted to work in the only four of these six new varieties are authorized in Rodillo and Murcia for, for one making. These four are Mirtia, Calnegre, Hebers, and Calblanque. And now in the following uh, slide, I'm going to describe briefly this one. Then. The third one is Mirtia. Mirtia is a cross between Monastrella and Sida. She's harvesting in the second half of August, approximately 35 days before Monastrella. I have to say that in the season, in our uh, open field, the climate is, or the temperature is approximately 40 degrees. So, if we have the account the quality day, the production is very good, uh, higher than 5,000 kilo per hectare. 
de que no le importa que es excelente y que no tiene antocianín, que falta en una estrella de grave, que tiene que ser muy bueno. Y en total el CDD es higher than la estrella de los que le damos. Pero la inequality wine, que es la estrella de grave, how the color intensity is very high. We obtain wines, we fit for values, we fit for the, the, those obtained in monastery wines. The total phenol indices on content is very high, double the monastery wine, or the anthocyanic content is excellent for for the monastery wine. The following is the big, the big is a cross between monastery and the union. This variety is harvested in the first half of September, approximately 16 days before monastery. The one regarding quality day is very similar to Miltia, um, because the field is very similar, the phenolic quality like Miltia, very excellent, uh, the pH very good, uh, the total acidity is higher than Monaster, perhaps a little bit less than, than Miltia. Uh, with respect to the quality wine, it's very similar in the media wines because the color intensity is very high, the total phenol content is again very high, and the anthocyanic content very good for the monastery wines. Uh, perhaps it will be less than media, but I have to say that this variety uh, <laughs> has a very good content of tannins and is a variety very tolerant to drought. The third variety is Hevas. Hevas is a cross between Monastery and Carmen Sauvignon. This is variety is harvested very close to Calnegre in the first half of September. And this variety, this variety regarding quality grape, uh, the, the production is higher than the previous one. The phenolic quality is very similar to the previous one. The pH is more similar to Monastery. And the total acidity is similar to, to Calnegre, and higher than Monastery. Um, with respect to quality wine, uh, it's very good, but a little bit less than, than the previous one uh, in understanding content or total content. So, in summary, from three red varieties with high phenol content and adapted to world climate, are characterized by having a less production than monastery, but the production is very good. And um, a very high acidity. Uh, very, very high phenol content. I have to point out the uh, other aspect, the harvest moment, because these three varieties are early varieties that monastery. Uh, in the recent, in the last years, it's very common in our, in our region, uh, a result of torrential rains. So, with these varieties are harvested before this, uh, the racial uh, rains happen because are more or less at the middle of the, of the September. So the last variety is Calguanque. Calguanque is a wide variety, but it's a cross the uh, monastery between with, with Cabernet Sauvignon. And these are two red varieties. Um, we obtain a wide variety. And the, the harvest day is the second half of August, very, very similar to Mintia, 33 days before Monastery. And with respect to quality grape, the production is very good, higher than 9,000 kilo per hectare, the pH is very good, uh, 3.44 approximately, the total acidity higher than Monastery, more or less than double. And the malleacty is very high, yes, double than Monastery. And regarding quality wine, I have to say that the alcohol level is approximately 12%. The maliac is 2.5 grams per litre. And the wine of this variety are very aromatic because they have a very high concentration of their pens. Their pens are compounds related to their own variety. Or this is a compound related to aromas to vegetables and grass, or many fruity, because they are a high concentration of festival. Well, uh, Imida, uh, sorry, Imida are collaborating with the sector. Some of the wineries belong to the three origin denominations, Guya, Humilla, and Yekla, have some of our new varieties planted in their wineries, because for us, it's very important to know the behavior of these new in different environments, 
because I said previously we are planting our uh, Spain without fee. In Stefader, we are participating in a national project because in, in which are participating other research centers and other communities from different parts of Spain. Uh, this center, research center, uh, this one is I'm going to plan to our new varieties, Calanque and Calnegres, in the next year. Again, for us, it's very important to, to know the behavior of these new varieties in different soils and different climates. So we are going to expect for the, the result in the future. Uh, as said previously, we are going to try to work with different research lines. Another research line we are working <coughs> is obtaining new variety to low sewer content and adaptive to our climate. The objective of this line is obtain wines with low alcohol content, but with high phenol content, and therefore high quality wines. How do we obtain, we obtain these, new, these new varieties? Well, we use initial process and we process a between them, and then we obtain 2,258 new plants, and then we select it, as I said previously, and nowadays we are having selected five new varieties, T4, T11, T75, T81, and T82, and these new varieties are characterized by having a very high acidity, very, very high calorie content, and extra content of harvest food. Um, an example of the wine of these new varieties, because we are in the second field of selection, like wine quality, is uh, we can see on the on the slide, you know, the graph. Uh, as we can see, the color intensity of the total polyphenol content, so the wine of the new variety are very high, the double of the triple of the values obtained by monastery wine. Uh, I have to point out the alcohol content of these new varieties because they are range between 10.4 and 12.5 approximately. Another line we are working is obtaining new varieties tolerant of the medium and medium. These are the main best in vineyards. And we are obtaining this new variety by crossing between monastery and other varieties with resistant gel to each best. These varieties are Radiance, Ismi Maltana, Asolaris. Um, right now, we are first to plant the field, which is from resistant to powdery medium. <coughs> the last uh, research line we are working is obtaining new varieties tolerant to rot and adapted to, to our climate. We are studying three new yellow uh, dyes. Uh, one is a cross between Monastery and Sida, and the other one is they are crossing between Monastery and Cabernet Sauvignon. And we are compared to their parental, Sida, Cabernet Sauvignon, and Monastery. <coughs> and we are studying these new genotypes in two irrigation treatment. One of them is a control deficit irrigation, in where we apply the 60% of the growth evapotranspiration. And the other irrigation treatment is a rainfall. We only provide the water for for precipitation, sorry. Because we are in the second phase selection by wine quality, I'm going to show some of the results obtained in the wines. As we can observe uh, on the graph, uh, the color intensity of the total polyphenol is very high in comparison to the parentals. Um, if we if we are taking account the vision treatment, we can observe how uh, overall, two of the you know, the genotypes, monaster per cabinet union 80 or monaster per sira 104, uh, uh, have a similar behavior in, in the two irrigation treatments. So it means that these two new genotypes or these new varieties are very tolerant to drought and adaptive to work. So in conclusion, for future wines in our area, uh, we can offer new varieties produce high quality grapes and wines in a favorable condition. We can offer a unique, innovative, and competitive advantage in the face of the climate crisis. And the most important, this will be a tool for the sector in a close future, but in no case it will replace our monastery. Um, now, I want to thank all the members of the teams for the technology of culture. I'm led to calculate in 20 from the leader before this uh, long process, the link work, 
uh, in which I had participated in many people and continue participating. Um, that's all. Thank you so much for your attention. Okay, uh, thank you, Rocío, so much for your presentation. And now, uh, the last uh, presentation before the round table is going to take place now with Joaquin Lamara from Cafate. He's assistant professor at the uh, Agricultural Engineering School in Madrid, uh, of the University of Architectic University of Madrid, uh, where I studied, actually. Um, and he's going to talk about the role of Umilla's soils in, in how it plays an important role in the resilience of our old vineyards. Uh, the theme of this trip, of this old vine trip, is, has been, it's been a soil for survival, how they, to, to, to try to, to understand how soils have been key uh, for our own vineyards to survive in this, you will know, uh, extreme conditions we have in, in our media region. Um, mm. And now, after uh, the, some studies he has undertaken these past uh, months, uh, he's going to tell us about uh, our soils. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank to the regulatory council for the video of media and, and to the All Vine Conference and for that I'm, I'm proud to be part of this conference here in Media. Uh, my presentation is called uh, The Role of the Soils, the Role of the Soils in Humilla's Terrains. And the answer, I think, is easy. Uh, hosting the vineyard of the best wine of the world. So, thank you for your attention. <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, so we are, we are going to talk about, about the soils and the heterogeneity of the soils we are seeing uh, these days during the, the field. So why, why we focus on soils when, when we are talking about vineyards? Uh, according to the resolution of the, of the o, uh, OIB, uh, the definition of terroir is that vitivinicultural <laughs> uh, terroir is a concept which refers to an area in which collective knowledge of the interaction between the identifiable physical and biological environment and applied vitivinicultural practices develops, providing distinctive characteristics for the products originating from this area. Continuing with the definition, the ROAR includes a specific soil, topographic, climate, landscape, Characteristics and biodiversity factors. Uh, it's important that, uh, according to the soil for the soil forming factor definition uh, proposed by Hans Jenny in the 40 in the 40th century, in the past uh, century, uh, the soil is the result of the effect of, of these five uh, factors. The soil is the result of the effect of fiber and organisms uh, on relief and fiber material along the time. Okay. Uh, these factors, we have the climate and the organisms the organisms are the vegetation and also the living beings. The living beings can be the children, but also a, a farmer with the tractor, okay. <laughs> and modifying the soil properties as, as we are, uh, have talked this morning. 
the, the method in which you plan, you can uh, destroy instead of um, uh, improve the soil properties. So, if we are now looking to the different factors, the soil forming factor affecting here in Humilla, uh, first of all, we have uh, the climate. Uh, a recent study uh, promoted by the regulatory council, the results, uh, the, the, the territory has been divided in, in five different zones that are uh, uh, established based on, in the, on the strong gradient between temperature and, uh, and the mean temperature of the observatories that are into the classes, the specific classes that define the, the climate. Uh, we can see that increasing the altitude uh, we decrease the temperature and we increase uh, but a little bit the, the average precipitation. Okay? Since the precipitation in this case in the lower parts of the, the, of the territory is 279 millimeters per year and in the upper parts are uh, 407 millimeters. Uh, yeah, per year. Uh, so, first of all, the, the, the rock is conditioned by this climate, and according to the climate characteristic, we can divide the designation of origin in four terrain. But also, another soil forming factor is the topography. So, based on the digital terrain model, that is this image of here, we have a huge variety of orientations and also <coughs> of a, a slope gradient of the, of the landscape. So, the situation is getting more, more complex. The, we, we have four climates, but we have uh, also all this varia variability according to the topographic characteristics of the region. Uh, one of the things that I now thought yet is that uh, in, in the climate study is not um, 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 introduced this, va this va uh, variability. Three of the vineyards we have visited this, uh, these days is north face, the orientation is north, and the last vineyard we have visited, the, uh, the one in Terron, is the only one that is south. Okay? And this changed the microclimatic condition in the specific vineyard, and this uh, microclimatic uh, variability is not, is not uh, catch in the thumbing. One of the reasons is that there are no enough uh, weather stations to, uh, to know about this variability in the, in the Umbrias, in the slopes that are facing north, or in the, in the south forest region. According to geology, these days we have talking about the, the, the heterogeneous geology of the region. For example, this map corresponds to another region of Spain. That uh, the, this region, the geology characteristic, is granitic, and you can see how is a geological map of one of these regions. This 
uh, in particular is in the in the central mountain range in Spain, in the region of Greenwich. Uh, this picture looks like a puzzle of big pieces. Okay, so the, this is the the variability of the geology, the pattern material in these in these areas. And this is an example of the variability at the same scale of the geological materials in our region. <laughs> so it's the same. <laughs> <laughs> uh, although, uh, no, also the the parts that are in in this color, in this color are alluvial deposits. So these parts are more heterogeneous than the other one because the sedimentary process uh, led, uh, led different layers of different materials in in no specific order. Okay. The clays, sand, gravel. So uh, First of all, we have climate, only four classes, different four classes, uh, before introduce the, the, the slow aspects, the orientation. After, with the, with the topographic characterization, we have more complexity, and with the geology, we have more complexity. So, what is the result? Uh, this. this is the variety of soils that all the soil profile uh, I, uh, well, I, I have described these profiles in public for now. Okay. And, and I don't know how to answer the question. Uh, what is the, the typical soil of Kumilla? <laughs> You can choose <laughs> what, what do you want the red one? So we have very different situation that are the results as Hans Jenny said in the definition of the soil forming factors of the factors affecting different geologies, different climates, different parent materials, and this is the situation. Um, Taxonomically, uh, we can talk about uh, alfisols or uh, insectisols according to the USDA taxonomy classification. But I think that this classification is difficult to communicate. That this is one of the of of your business, the, the communication of of the soil characteristics. Uh, many of them. We can talk that one of the main characteristics is the, the con a high content of carbonates, but about texture, we cannot uh, extract a clear conclusion about that. Uh, seven of these soil profiles uh, we are going to visit or we are already visited uh, yet, and the other ones, but all of them are sampled, and the results of the texture analysis of all these samples is this one. Yes. The, the red dots are the surficial sample. So, according to the soil texture, we can say that our soil are sandy loam on the surface. But if we go deeper, okay, we have a lot of samples that have also this tester, but we have a huge, huge variety of, of textures from <coughs> sand to clay. Going to San Vicente, no, no, so, so, the soil is in familiar, 
the majority of the soils. We can see that this sandy loam, but this a uh, huge simplification. Okay. The complexity we are seeing these days is, is higher than, 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 than that conclusion. And just to highlight some soil properties, uh, we can talk also about the rock fragments in the soils, in all the soil samples that uh, we are analyzed. And um, we saw that the rock fragment, the average, is uh, around 40, with a minimum of 8 and a maximum of 8. Uh, the second variable is the available water holding capacity. That is one, I think, uh, and, uh, especially in, in without irrigation, is the one of the main role of the soils in Colombia. That is, uh, give the water to plants for complete the growing cycle. And we have an average of 100, uh, 100 millimeters. So this is 100 liters per square meter. And if you see the, the design of the plantations, the plants are separated more than in other regions. The, the plantation is two and a half meters per two and a half meters, so each plant has six meters or less, or six, almost seven, to, for explore. So this provide, can provide 700 millimeters per year for each plant. That is the reason of, the, of this density of plantation. Uh, Yes. And, well, the minimum of the water holding capacity is the one we have seen this morning in La Olla de Santa Ana, in, in the vineyards of Olivares, uh, nice fossils. <laughs> and the water holding capacity is only 47 millimeters. Uh, Earlier. And, and the maximum is 150 liters per square meter. Okay. And <laughs> other things that we are looking these days is the content of carbonates in the vineyards. That is also a characteristic of the of the vineyards in Comilla. And surprisingly. The average content of total carbonate in all the samples is almost 50. So it's a huge quantity of, of carbonates in soil. The minimum is 40 and the maximum is 80. And the maximum is not an exception. You have seen that we have this content in, in different vineyards of which uh, we have visited these days. And also, the same conclusion is according to the active uh, calcium carbonate, where the average is 14, that is uh, very high. Well, now, <laughs> yeah, the number uh, <laughs> the minimum is 4, and the maximum is, is 14. Okay. And, other things we have seen these days, the content of organic matter, that the average was, was low, but not too much, because this content of carbonates prevent the metabolization, the mineralization of this organic matter. And the average content of organic matter is almost 1, is 0 0.9, that the Mediterranean condition is not too low. Um, uh, okay, now yes, thank you for the attention. <laughs> <laughs> I'm
I'm sure you'll join me in thanking uh, Rothio and Joaquin for their presentations. Thank you. I've, I've learned so much and I'm looking forward to quizzing you a bit more. Um, I'm going to start by asking a question to each of you and then we're going to open the floor up for your questions and comments. So um, my first question is for Joaquin and I wanted to know in this exploratory study did you find anything that surprised you? Uh, well, what a surprising <laughs> question. <laughs> I don't mean like physically. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, in the pit. <laughs> really, the 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 soil properties uh, itself, uh, because you can have a, an idea about about the characteristics of the soils in the region, but when you make open the soil profile, take the samples, analyze the the root depth. And, and all these things, uh, you, you obtain results in the laboratory that you cannot expect. I don't know if, if this piece of soil has 20% of carbonates or 1% of organic matter. So, so for me, the, well, one of the conclusions um, or the most sur surprising thing for me is the adaptability of, of Ancraft uh, Monastrel to soil conditions that are not easy uh, for many of the commercial rootstock. <coughs> and the Monastrel can directly uh, support this content of active calcium carbonate that uh, very few commercial rootstock can can resist and maybe for this <laughs> could be interesting uh, register uh, the monastery as uh, as a as a rootstock I mm. don't know if it is ah. possible. <laughs> Because, yeah. <laughs> what do you think I, I of that know. idea? You, you have, you have. <laughs> because the same, the same variety, no? Yeah. Well, but uh, why not? <laughs> because you only can register new varieties. Uh, no, because if you use different stock, yeah. it's not a different variety. Yeah, but the varieties of the rootstock. Uh, Yeah, 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 but I, I'm not sure that Phylloxera attack all the clones of Monastrel. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So this is a question that you've asked yeah. yourself. Yes, okay. Yes. okay, I don't know. Okay, interesting. One for further study. So there had been in this region a long-standing regard for this ungrafted Monastrel. It's something that is mentioned by a lot of great producers in your deck. You know, um, Yumiya, it's the um, identity of Monastrel. So this is something that by long usage <laughs> you value. But this study actually suggests initially that there could be um, a, a kind of an unexpected, ex you know, very high ad adaptation of Monastrel to these soils mm -hmm. rather than it just being kind of luck or usage, mm. there's actually um, an adaptation that has developed in, in these biotypes. Mm. Um, so um, do you think that it would make sense for the region to really focus on ungrafted monastrel as its kind of most premium sort of heritage product? I open that out to... <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Is I legal? The new plantings are no. not permitted, but the existing plantings of ungrafted monastrel, there are what, a thousand hectares? At least. At least. And they are permitted. They are obviously a, I guess they are, um, they have a finite life, but they seem to inspire a lot of, yeah, um, well, a lot of creative brilliance with producers. And in terms of putting Yumia on the map as a kind of fine wine region of Spain, this kind of, you know, for one generation only, <laughs> you could, <laughs> you, you mm. can actually drink ungrafted monastrel. Is that something that you think you could make more of in your... Well, the last yesterday's tasting, um, I would say the majority of the wines uh, were ungrafted monastrel, all vines, of course, they were all vines. Uh, and well, this is something that we discuss in the plenary, in the council, uh, kind of um, first uh, regulating the use of the words Pierre Franco and Old Vine in, in Humilla wines so that uh, we can really certify that they, they are, it's true what the label is saying. And uh, for the moment, uh, no decision has uh, come up. But uh, in terms of promotion from the Humilla wines, this is what we're doing: promoting in terms of premium wines, our most premium wines, and grafted monastrel for sure. And I think that many of the wineries here present uh, agree with us that most of our premium wines are ungrafted monastrel. Could I ask for a show of hands from the people in the audience who, if you think it's critical that at some point the use of the terms Pierre Franco and um, an old vine become regulated within the denomination, do you want to, if you think it's important, it's critical that that happens, could you raise your hand? Okay, so. And if you think it's nice to have, but it's okay probably to allow it to be, you know, self-regulating, could you raise your hand? Okay, so I think most people think that it's important to have a, a certification, control of the use of the terms. I agree, actually, I think at some point, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, have I just said something really controversial? No. No, no. We, these are the conversations we we usually have uh, in the main uh, meeting room in the council. So we'll keep them going. On, so. Okay. <laughs> um, I I think it's um, good to have the discussion and the debate. And I think that there comes a point when, if you're starting to add value through the use of the term, you then need to protect. The, the use of the term. Um, and if, I think if we ever get to a point where a Pierre Franco and Old Vine becomes so valuable that people are willing to pass off the wines, then it will kind of show that we've kind of made progress, but you probably want to regulate before you get to that point. Um, and then um, I wanted to ask um, Rothio, um, uh, when do you think that the new varieties that you have developed will start to be really planted in the region and how do you see them being used alongside the existing varieties? It's the interesting question. The million dollar question. <laughs> yes, the million dollar. Because it's a long process, I said in my presentation. But now, right now, we are we are giving our material to the breeds. The nursery. The nursery, sorry. The nursery. So I will expect him by the nursery multiply the vegetal material. And then we are expecting that this material are, um, are um, for the sector, yeah. We can serve with the sector. Yeah. And will you, for example, give some 
um, of the planting material to some key wineries to ask them to plant it, to replant with this material, or you know, how how will you sort of roll out the yeah. the the actual plantings of these new varieties with commercial wineries? Well, some wineries have already yes, have yeah. already experimental yeah, plantings. Experimental. experimental. Yes, yeah. experimental in our wine, experimental winery. We had winemaking. Winemakers and producers. Yes, 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 and producer in experimental uh, design. So now some of these wineries and the producer have now and have right now some of the new register varieties. So they can use as new varieties because they planting in the past. So they these new these new varieties only have these new these wineries and this producer the at the moment the thing is that as we spoke you know um, to plant vines you need to have uh, authorization exactly. it's not free you're not free to plant a, a vineyard whatever you want it's just ultra regulated yeah. uh, crop um, so once now that they're registered and once uh, and now they are authorized in the region of Murcia, Murcia, soon they will be authorized in the region of Castilla-La Mancha, so in the Albacete part and, and, and Castilla-La Mancha part of the DO. Uh, and once the nursery has half the, the, the the, the plants, the material, the wineries with authorization to plant could or wineries or producers will be able to plant commercial commercial uh, plants because at the moment the only uh, no, vineyards are experimental yes and of the four new varieties um Cal Blanc, <laughs> sorry <laughs> i'm trying to remember all of their names of the four new varieties do you feel really confident about any of them that you know, in a hundred years' time, you'll have one hundred year old Cal Blanc. I, you know, in <laughs> you know, that, that kind of that kind of planting I, I to really grow old. Yes, of course, because yeah. we are we are very confident in our new varieties because they are very high potential. <coughs> so we expect that in a hundred years, our varieties are. Uh, the, I don't know the solution, but it's, I, I say in presentation, it's a tool for the sector um, here in the region of Murcia because the climate change is, uh, is a, a reality. So we need different tools to, to solve the, the problem. So we, as IMIDA, as a research center, we offer this material for the solution for the sector if they want, of course. <laughs> We won't see them, they're 100 years old, but in 50 years, some of us will, hopefully. And um, the, um, the other thing um, I, I wanted to ask you was, um, at the end of your presentation, you had in very big font, these, will, these new varieties will not replace our monastrels. Yes, what, what was the thinking behind that statement? Um, I mean that the, the, the new varieties are the tool for the, the region in order to mix with monastery, for example, if we want to, to, to solve some of the problems of the monastery in the future, we can miss to do copas or to, do, to elaborate together with monastery with different techniques in the wineries. There are, it's a tool we can do use in different ways in order to, to get wines with a high quality in our regions. So, for me. so would you think of Monastrell as like um, a bit of a problem child or a <laughs> secret superhero? <laughs> superhero. Is it okay. Superhero. <laughs> um, um, and can I ask another hands up question to the audience? Um, we know that Monastrell, we've had some fantastic wines and we know that Monastrell can reach and, and um, its wines can present with relatively high alcohol, 14.5, 15, 15.5. Um, who thinks of itself that is um, a, a big problem? 
Okay, nobody. Of course, we need balance, but in and of itself. Okay. Amaya says, wherever there's balance, there's no problem. Okay, I agree. I don't think it's a problem, child. I think at its best, I think it's the most incredible variety full of paradox and uh, beautiful texture and a kind of um, an elemental power, yeah. kind of like the place. Um, would anyone like to ask some questions for our speakers? Yes. That's fine. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, uh, after, you know, Sarah's tough questions, I'm going to throw an easy one in from the field. <laughs> in your presentation, you characterized uh, the Marcella idea as, uh, as uh, having a neutral flavor. Could you expand on that a little bit? I was surprised to see that. Yeah, yeah. It's in the, no, it's in the grape. Ah, in the first slide, the first slide. No, it's a, it's a grape. It's a grape. It's a grape. No, the wine. The wine has a very aromatic uh, flavors. And it's a characterization of the grape. On the grape, of the fresh grape. Uh, but, um, mm -hmm. but how do you characterize the grape as being having neutral flavor? That's, that's the question. <laughs> neutral is not. Maybe if you think about a muscat grape that you eat it, it's very aromatic, and maybe a monastrel fresh grape. They can, there are some winemakers behind uh, who can maybe attest to this, no? That monastrel fresh grape is not especially aromatic. Like, like most of them, yeah. So you wouldn't have monastrel for dessert, monastrel grapes, yes. probably. <laughs> but the wine are really aromatic. Connecting with something, as far as I know, when uh, uh, viticulturists de describe the, the grapes, there, there are very few aromatic <coughs> grapes, yes, like uh, Muscat, or yeah. uh, Gevitraminer, Alvarillo, maybe in between. But most of the grapes, as far as I know, are described as neutral. But, but they describe the grape. The grape. The grape. Yeah. That's right. Thank you. I have a question for you. Yeah, for me? And then, yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, I have another question. Later. <laughs> Later? Yeah, in private. And so, Sarah, you noted that some areas have started to define exactly what an old vine is. Um, and you referenced that Tiki in Spain, so you're better right saying 70 years and real with 35. Do you think that that might be confusing to consumers on a label if there's slightly different definitions coming from the same country? I think it could be, but they're probably used to being confused. Um, I mean, I think, I mean, I, I, I mean, how do you convey everything about wine? You know, it's, I, I mean, I think um, that having different definitions makes it is valid and kind of authentic from the the wine making and the viticultural point of view because terrains are so different and um, you know some some environments are really like hard yards for grapes you know <laughs> it's like you know, people have hard lives, you know, and, and vines can have harder lives. So um, I think that the term old vine, heritage vineyard, should allow for a level of local determination that is agreed at by that collective know-how um, of growers who think actually here, like the South Africans, we're going with 35 years. I mean, they have much older than that, but that's their minimum. And then on their seal, they simply have heritage vineyard. So they, they basically, I think heritage vineyard is a great term, by the way. I would use that rather than old vine. Um, so I think you almost put the number like behind the scenes, and then you have the term 
this is a heritage vineyard, you know, basically agreed on by the collective of people making making it. And all the whole history of Appalachian, you know, Consejo Regulador's, it all starts with a group of relatively like-minded producers coming together in a collective and then it being formalized with time. So yeah, I mean, it can be confusing, but it can just join the club of confusing, stroke, intriguing <laughs> things about wine. Yeah. No. Um, I just wanted to comment on the last um, point that you made about labelling. What some regions, and uh, Maya will probably tell me if I'm wrong here, but I believe in Ribera de Duero, if you put old vine on the label, you then have to define it on the back label. If you put altitude, high altitude on the front label, you then have to say above 800 metres or whatever. So they've kind of got these different, you know, you can only say it on the label if if it's justified with the facts on the back label. So. Yeah, that's, yeah. The has also recently you know, so you, you say all rice, and you have to put it. Yes. So uh, it depends on the, on the regulation. Yeah. It's, it's complicated. <laughs> Perhaps it would be great to have you know, like a global sea for all vineyards in Spain, that would be great, and then uh, small differences for each vineyard. Like, yeah, it could be the uh, rapid vineyards. In Granada, for instance, they, um, the fact that they say 70 years is because they had the photographs from, from the American flags that they could prove uh, that these premiers were not old. Yeah. So they really wanted to be carried mm. and they had the way to prove it. And that's the way <coughs> they choose the second. Now there's an explanation yes. for the 70 years in the history of the Yes, that's a really lovely piece of historical interest, actually. This was, was this... Um, was this during the, t um, the time of um, Franco when they were basically the American aerial yeah, they, they mapping? Photograph. So they took photographs, which then the vignerons were then able to go back and refer to, and they could say, well, look, this vine here's this vineyard, and it was a kind of high-resolution image. Yeah, yeah. So they were able to actually prove it. Actually, this is another reason for sometimes the minimum age being set at a kind of um, an, an uncontroversial kind of minimum provable yeah. um, level because sometimes some regions have fantastic documentation um, able to attest to these claims or individual producers do but very often, actually, this information is lost, but that's why we wanted to create the old vine registry so that moving forward, at least there is a record <laughs> um, of some kind. Um, because um, other, it's, it's, it's highly variable, and that's why we have these very local um, solutions to it, which I think is better than not trying to do anything, but yeah. <laughs> I would, I would add something. I think in the case of Spain, I think it should be the Spanish ministry who should regulate some terms for everyone. Mm. Uh, because then uh, we would all have the same minimum, at least minimum uh, criteria. Uh, and not like now, right now, that everybody is regulating or not regulating. and. How is <laughs> impossible the consumer to be not be uh, confused with this uh, and well um, crazy use of terms in one region and the other? And I think it's the ministry's duty. Yeah.
as it has regulated in the past many other terms, mm -hmm. uh, I think it's time now. No one in the ministry here. <laughs> <laughs> If you all just do really crazy things, will the ministry sort of be provoked into, <laughs> into action? Well, who knows? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I had a, a question specifically for Joaquin, um, if we could move on. I wondered if you could summarise for us the features of soil, and I know you said that it's very varied across Humea, um, but if there are a few key factors that you think have allowed Monastrell to grow old in such an extreme Mediterranean climate? Um, well, can you repeat the question, please? Do you want me to say it in Spanish? Podría resumir y ya he entendido que hay muchas variedades de suelos en Jumilla, pero si podrías resumir algunos puntos no, algunos factores del suelo de aquí que ha significado que Monastrel ha podido crecer, bueno, ser, llegar a tener sí. más de 35, 50 años en un clima tan extremo, tan mediterráneo. Eh, thank you. Ahora entiendo mucho mejor tu inglés. Gracias. <laughs> <laughs> eh, eh, well, I think that the, the characteristics of the soils is the, the water holding capacity. Um, also the, the stoniness in the, in the surface or the, the capacity of sand layers to preserve the, the wetness of the soil, as we have seen this morning in Cerro. Um, one of the characteristics that more surprised me for the results is the content of the active carbon, calcium carbonate that for the audience uh, the difference between total carbonate and the active calcium carbonate is the, that total carbonate is um, determine with a strong acid. So you valorize all the carbonates in the soil. But the active car carbonate uh, is determined with, um, I don't know if, if this is right in English, with, with soft acids, not... Soft acids. Yes. Mm. Is, uh, because the the roots when for growing uh, develop a acid uh, environment close to the to the root to um, degrade the soils and can enter in the soil and with this valorization with soft acid you determine this discontent of of calcium carbonate that can be degraded by uh, soft acids and not uh, strong acids. And for me is very surprising because uh, I am used to use for, uh, uh, for advising uh, uh, wine, growing, gr wine growers uh, the tables of the characteristics of the rootstock. And no many, well, I think that more than 20% of calcium carbonate, active calcium carbonate, only uh, the 140 Ruggeri, and I don't know if mm, another, can survive uh, and develop well in this kind of soils. And according to the results of the, the profiles we have described for this conference, uh, the contents in some soils uh, are higher than this 20 percent. It's 28 percent, and you have a, a nice develop of the of the root system of the monastery. So for me, it's, it's surprising. One more. <coughs> Hi, uh, 
and it's a question for actually the whole group. We've tried, and we know Monastrell is the great oil for Mia. We've tried some wonderful white wines from the region, and the study you did of the, the new clones, you've got a white grape varietal there. Do we feel as a group that white wines are important to this region going forward with higher alcohols and people looking for less alcohol in wines, most of them are 13%, 13.5, your white wines? Do you feel that white wines have a future in this region? And that's for, that's for the whole group as well, a show of hands or... Yes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I agree. Me <laughs> too. <laughs> yes. Go white wines, go. Some of the winemakers as well, do they feel that white wines are important for the future of this region? Like some of these guys, because they're the ones making the wines, producing these wonderful monastrels, but we've had some really nice white wines as well. Yeah, yeah. And you will taste much more uh, immediately, yeah. because we have prepared um, a stand uh, tasting in Salone, Maria Luna. It's not so far from here, we go in the bus. And you will have the chance to taste all the white wines from our wineries. Well, not all, <laughs> some. <laughs> And some more. Thank you. Could I um, please thank uh, Rothio and Joachim um, and also, of course, Carolina. Thank you for your presentations. And I'd also, can I also thank, uh, I didn't do this earlier, I'd like to thank our regional ambassador for the Old Vine Conference, Anna Harris Noble, who put us on to Himia and is my fantastic guide to all things great happening in Spain and it was Anna who introduced us and I'm absolutely thrilled that she did and thank you for helping to bring all of this together so let's go taste and have dinner